enabled us to bring in our speaker for today. I also want to thank Hebrew Union College Church Institute for Religion, led by Dean Joshua Polo, who's here with his. Um, shalom, everybody. Thank you, Chagit, for this wonderful eulogy. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here, and I'm honored, and I want to, to thank Ruth and USC and Hillel. It's really a great honor. With your permission, before we start, because nobody will believe me, I'm going to take a selfie. Okay? <laughs> so tuck your tummies in. Okay. Now we have proof. Um, I'll start by saying that you may not be aware of it, but um, I'm really thankful to you all. I owe you big time, and I'll explain why. So I'm Gil Chovav. I'm 60 years old, born in Jerusalem, live in Tel Aviv like everybody else. And for the, for the past uh, 34 years, I live with Danny, my partner. Danny was my officer in the intelligence service, and we're together for 34 years, and we have a daughter. And um, Danny is a professor of computer science in the Tel Aviv University. Now, it is clear to all of us that I married beneath me. I mean, he is a mere <laughs> professor of computer science. I'm Gil Chovav, come on. <laughs> but, but he thinks that he's superior for two reasons. One, he says, I don't know math, which is not true. It's just the vision that I shy away from. <laughs> Secondly, he says, you don't like classical music. I ask you, who does? But anyway, um, one day, about five years ago, uh, I get a phone call from the Israeli Philharmonic. 
they have this series of concerts called the Philharmonic in Jeans. Basically, it's concerts for idiots. <laughs> and since it's, you know, more popular uh, the classical music, they, ho they want celebrities to host the uh, concerts. And uh, as in Israel, I'm a minor celebrity. They asked me whether I would be willing to host a concert by the Philharmonic. Now, I really am not interested, but I knew that Danny would be shocked, so immediately I said, yes, of course, I'll do it. And then they say, good, it's the day after tomorrow. <laughs> it's clear to us that somebody said yes and ran away, and then they were stuck without a minor celebrity, so they said, okay, we'll take the Yemenite guy. Um, <laughs> and here I am on stage in the biggest uh, concert hall in Tel Aviv interviewing opera singers and violinists and you name it, and all through the concert I see Danny's eyes shimmering with terror in the audience. Now, by the end of the concert, he came to pick me up from the green room, and uh, I knew he would say something like that was horrible or something like this. He came to me, gray-faced, and murmured, this was the end of Western civilization. <laughs> now, <clears throat> just think of it, of Danny hearing that I was lecturing in USC. He would die, he would die, and it's all because of you, so thank you very much. I owe you big time, okay? <laughs> now that this is established, uh, we're here to talk about my great-grandfather, Eliezer ben Yehuda, who revived Hebrew, as most of you know, I guess. Hebrew was totally dead for 2,000 years, and it's the only language in the history of, man, of mankind who was resurrected as a mother tongue, as a spoken language. Um, but I want to start with a confession. So in my family, the Ben Yehuda family, we tend to rank cities according to the size of the Ben Yehuda street that we got. <laughs> so Jerusalem is wonderful. It's a part of the triangle that, that forms the CBD. Tel Aviv is great. It's a big, big, big avenue parallel to the beach. Be'er Sheva, Rehovot, Ra'anana, Haifa. Eh. <laughs> Los Angeles has a long way to go, okay? So, so maybe by my next visit, you'll fix it. Um, so let's start near the end. So picture me. Um, 35 years ago, when I was 25, an apprentice in a newspaper. I really started from rock bottom. If they would open a new sock rack in the department store, I would put a line about it in the newspaper and be sure that I was Emil Zola, at least. But, uh, you know, I enjoyed seeing how newspapers happen, how news become headlines, <clears throat> so I would sit at the desk of the newspaper and see what, what goes on. One evening, I'm at the newspaper at the desk, and we get word that it happened yet again. What happened yet again? So if there are any Jerusalemites in the crowd, they might know that in Jerusalem we have a very nice tradition that at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, members of the ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem, the super, super, super religious, the Neturei Karta, uh, arm themselves with bats and axes and bottles of black spray, go up to the old Jewish cemetery on the Mount of Olives, break into the burial plot of my family, which is surrounded by a fence, desecrate all the graves, and smear them with nasty graffitis in tar and in black paint. And uh, then City Hall fixes it, fixes it and then it, happened, it happens yet again and again and again and again for years and years. Very sweet. Um, and we got word that it happened yet again. And I did not know whether I should call my elderly aunt, who was still alive at the time, and tell her that the graves of her parents and her grandparents and their uncles and aunts were desecrated yet again. I won't tell you what I did. If you behave, maybe in the end I will. But in the meantime, no. Um, but for the meantime, let's think about it. What was it and what is it still in this annoying person, Eliezer ben Yehuda, in this short, red-headed, blood-coughing, he had tuberculosis all his life, person, Missing one finger, you know, Jews in those times 
were uh, mutilating themselves in order not to serve in the Tsar's army, so they would either chop off one finger or pour boiling oil into one ear. He chose to depart of his finger, uh, to part of his finger, and uh, what was it in this person? Very weird, very sensitive about his honor, with no sense of humor whatsoever. What was it? And is it still in him that makes people so engaged with his figure, even today, which is exactly 100 years since he died? He died in 1922, so exactly 100 year, years after he died, that on one hand ma makes ultra-Orthodox people in Jerusalem go through the trouble of going in the middle of the night with axes and bats and the, the, to the graveyard and desecrating his grave. And on the other hand, makes UNESCO, the culture organization of the United Nations, declare him as one of Western civilization's greatest culture figures. There was a big ceremony, Eliezer ben Yehuda, Isaac Newton and Haydn, none of them appeared, it was 12 years ago, but still, <laughs> they were all declared as greatest figures of uh, Western civilization. So, Laser Perlman, this is the original name, was born in 1858 in Luzhki, a village in Lithuania, uh, to a typical Jewish family of the mid 19th uh, century very religious, very poor. Shortly after he was born, his father passed away. His mom was left with five children. And within a few years, she realized she had to make a choice that nowadays would seem to us satanic, but at the time was quite common. She realized she did not have enough bread to put on the table for five children, and that one of them has to go. And she picked little laser. She said he's the sharpest of them all, and maybe with his wits, he'll be able to survive without a family. And he was sent to be educated at the home of a distant relative, not rich, but at least not dirt poor, very religious, very strict, very unhappy about the fact that he had yet another mouth to feed. Um, Years later, when Eliezer ben Yehuda was already an important person and an American journalist came to interview him, the journalist started, as we journalists do, by saying, well, to begin with, why don't you tell me a bit about your childhood? And Eliezer ben Yehuda snapped, well, I didn't have one, which is true. He did not have a childhood. He was spotted immediately as an ilui, as a genius, he studied in a cheder, in a traditional Jewish school, religious school. We're talking about the mid-19th century. Hebrew is totally, totally, totally dead. Think of Latin today, it's the same. It may be the, the language of prayer, of writings, of books, but nobody speaks it. And even people who do pray in it, in most cases, do not understand what they're reciting. It's just the sound that they know. Um, but it's mid-19th century, it's the Enlightenment era, it's Tkufat HaHaskala. Jewish scholars in Germany, in the north of France, start toying with their biblical language, with their synagogue language, and just for the fun of it, they try to see whether they can translate into it modern writings of their time. And one of Laser Perelman's uh, teachers, rabbis, in, in this cheder that he studies at, uh, is a scholar like this, and through him, he gets hold of a book in Hebrew, which is not a religious book, which is not Tanakh Mishnah Talmud. Would you know what was the first Hebrew book that the reviver of Hebrew read in his life? Robinson Crusoe. A very, very, very naive translation of Robinson Crusoe, two points, Chagid. And uh, he reads the book and he falls in love with the language. And, um, and he knows that this is for life. Um, one night, his uncle catches him 
in bed reading that forbidden book. Now, for God's sake, this is not Playboy that he's reading. It's Robinson Crusoe. But no, 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 no. Jewish kids were not allowed to read what we call outer books, books that do not deal with religion. His uncle tells him, you cast shame upon this house and upon my family. Take your tefillin and leave. Think of it. A 15-year-old kid, younger than yourselves, being thrown out of home in the middle of the night in winter in Eastern Europe, no family, no relatives, no network, nothing. What would he do? He says, I'll walk towards the east. Maybe one day I'll get to Moscow, and Moscow is a big place. And, uh, and here starts a chain of... I'm laughing because I'm going to say a word that is not connected to Eliezer ben Yudai in any word, in any sense, miracles. Now, he was not a believer. He did not believe in God for one second in his life. But we cannot describe what happens to him without using the word miracles. Miracle number one. This kid is walking. We're talking about Eastern Europe before the two world wars. It's scattered with Jewish towns and villages. And he walks towards the east from town to village, from village to town, being dependent on kind hospitality of Jews. If he's lucky, a family would pick him up and feed him and let him sleep for one night or two. If he's unlucky, he sleeps in the synagogue. Miracle number one, it's night. He sleeps on a bench in the synagogue, into the synagogue, walks a rich Jewish person, a vodka maker for the Tsar. These are my jeans. <laughs> Mr. Shlomo Naftali Herz Jonas. He starts a conversation with a young man, and he asks him, who are you? What are you doing here? Why are you sleeping on the bench? Don't you have a home? Don't you have a family? And he's so impressed with the wits of the young man that he tells him, you know what? Come and be a private tutor to for my children. Again, mid-19th century, when you say a private teacher or a private tutor, it's not like today that if kids have problems with math or a foreign language, a teacher would come for an hour or something. It's a resident teacher who lives with the family and, and is in charge of the education of the children. Um, Laser Perelman is the teacher of the Jonas kids, and his way of thanking Mr. Jonas for saving him from starvation and from homelessness and you name it, is coming up to him after a year and telling him, well, Mr. Jonas, for the past year, I've been having an affair with your daughter. <laughs> Actually, we're doing it. And I'm going to take her to Palestine. And we're going to teach everybody to speak Hebrew in Palestine. Now, compared to nowadays, it's as if someone would come to you and say, I'm having a forbidden romance with your daughter. I'm going to take her to Congo or to Rwanda. And there, we'll teach everybody to speak Latin. It sounds very logical, right? <laughs> but we're talking about miracles. Mr. Jonas looks at the fresh young man and says, a brilliant idea. <laughs> But before, before you marry my daughter and take her to this godforsaken, you know, province at the edge of the failing Ottoman Empire, you're such a bright young man. Let me send you, at my own expense, to Paris, to the Sorbonne. You'll study medicine. You'll become a doctor. Everybody needs a doctor all over the world. When you go to Palestine to teach everybody how to speak Hebrew, you'll be able to support my daughter, yourself, your children. Laser Perelman thinks about it for a minute and says, you know what? OK, takes the money, goes to Paris, sends beautiful letters about his studies. Of course, never enters the Sorbonne, sits in cafes, drinks all the money with journalists and politicians, and contracts tuberculosis, which at that time was a death sentence. He is sent to try to recover in Algeria, in a sanatorium in the north of Africa, and there, two more miracles. Miracle number one, he meets, for the first time in his life, a Frank, a Sephardi Jew. He never saw a Sephardi Jew. 
Now, this was a guy from Jerusalem, a Sephardi Jew from Jerusalem. Sephardi Jews in Jerusalem knew a bit more Hebrew than the Ashkenazis. And for the first time in his life, Laser Perelman, the would-be reviver of Hebrew, hears Hebrew in the Sephardi accent. Now think of it, it's very, very different. If we would take a verse of our national poet, Chaim Nachman Bialik, a great poet who, by the way, detested Eliezer Ben Yudai, couldn't stand him, but he was a great poet, of course. If I will recite it uh, in the Ashkenazi accent, it's Shalom Rav Shuvech Tzipora Nechmedes. It's very round, it's very sweet, it's very gentle, it's very Central European. But if I recite it in the Sephardi accent, Shalom Rav Shuvech Tzipora Nechmada. It's majestic. <laughs> this is what the language of God should sound like. And Laser Perlman hears it, this Ashkenazi young man, and says, this is what a Semitic language should sound like, with an Arab accent, not with a Hungarian accent. And this is how he spoke all his life and his children, with a Sephardi accent. Miracle number two, this heathen, Eliezer ben Yudah, or Laser Perlman at the time, who does not believe in God, writes in his memoir that one night there is a lightning in the sky and a big voice thunders upon him, the revival of the Jewish people in its own land, in its own language. And he knows that that is his vocation, goes back to Europe, starts preparing to immigrate to Palestine, but being at least honest, annoying, but honest, he sends a telegram to his fiance, to Dvorah Yonas in Eastern Europe, telling her, I'm really doing it. I'm going to Palestine to teach all the Jews how to speak Hebrew again. This is no place for a fine, young, educated lady like yourself. You're exempt from this marriage. You do not have to marry me. Marry whoever you wish to. But Dvora is a tough cookie. And she won't let anyone fire her from her marriage by telegram. She conducts a marriage without him. She marries him when he's away. All night long, she dances in a white wedding gown with friends and family. In Eastern Europe, he's in Paris. And at midnight, she sits to, for one last game of chess with her father, Shlomo Naftali Herz Yonas. And her father plays tough. And at 3 AM, he says, checkmate, Dvora. I win. You lose. Maybe it's a sign. Maybe it's not such a good idea. Think again. Maybe you don't have to go to Palestine. And she tells him, I'm unlucky in games because I'm lucky in love. Takes off her wedding gown, puts on a, a black suit, a black man's suit, and starts stealing the borders in night trains. You know, Jews were not allowed to travel freely in those times. To steal the border towards the west, gets to Western Europe, grabs Laser Perlman by the neck and says, you promised to marry me and marry me you will. Get on a ship, they sail to Palestine, on the way they get married in Egypt, and they get to the port of Palestine, to Jaffa, in 1881. This is very, very, very early Zionism. This is 20 years before the Congress of Herzl. This is very early Zionism. In Jaffa, Laser Perelman says three things. One, my name is no longer Laser Perelman. My name is Eliezer ben Yehuda. Ben Yehuda, the son of Judah. Judah was the name of his father, but Judah is also the name of the land. I belong in here. And actually, Ben Yehuda is a name that many Zionists took after Ben Yehuda to show that they shed the diaspora behind, and now they belong in this new country that they came to. Two, says Eliezer ben Yehuda, I did not come to Palestine to be in Jaffa. I want to go to Jerusalem. Now, nowadays, a trip from Jaffa to Jerusalem, depending on traffic, would be 50 minutes. So everybody tells him, OK, go tomorrow. No, right now. In those days, it's an eight-hour trip, a carriage and a horse through this winding road that leads to Jerusalem filled with wolves and thieves and gangs and you name it. 
No, I won't sleep in Jaffa. I want to go to Jerusalem. All night long, they travel to Jerusalem. And three, he looks at, it, at, he looks at his wife, Dvorah, and tells her, Dvorah, we are making a vow that from this very day, where our lands are on the soil of the Holy Land, we shall never, ever utter even one foreign word, only Hebrew. Now think of it, it's very difficult. They were very educated. They knew the Bible and the Mishnah and the Talmud and these writings are mostly in Hebrew, so they knew Hebrew. But in the Bible, people do not make omelets. So if you want to make an omelet, there is no word for a pan. So you're not supposed to say, Eliezer, give me the, and then say pan in Russian, Yiddish, French, German, every language that they spoke, no. You're supposed to describe what you need. So, Eliezer, give me a round metal dish so I can, there is no verb for scramble, I can confuse eggs <laughs> in order to make something that you eat for breakfast. And then he will remember that in the Bible there is a dish called chavitim, which is made of eggs, and from chavitim he will make machvat for a pan and chavita for an omelet. But if on the way, she makes a mistake, or he makes a mistake, and any of them utters a foreign word, the other one has every right to pinch him. <laughs> Remember those pinches, we'll come back to them. Life in Jerusalem was super difficult. The city was totally hostile to the Ben Yehuda family. Jews in the cities, in the four cities that were inhabited by Jews in those times, Jerusalem, Jaffa, Tiberias, and Safed, were not Zionists. The, 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 the rulers of the country were the Ottomans, the Turks, and Jews did not want to cause any trouble, and of course they did not want to partake in any political action. The only Zionist Jews were in the settlements, and were very few, and Jews in Jerusalem were hostile to Eliezer ben Yehuda, and to his trial of, of changing the language that they speak. They would be speaking Arab, French, Ladino, Yiddish, German, you name it, but not Hebrew. Now, if you come to a hostile city and you want all the Jews to start speaking Hebrew, where would you start? It's difficult, right? So one day, I was giving this lecture in a kibbutz to children in a kibbutz in Tuba, near Jerusalem. And I asked the children, where would he start? And the kids didn't know what to answer except for one said, I have an idea. I know, I know, I know, I know. I said, yes, yes, yes. tell us quickly. He said, tell him to open a bank in Hebrew. Jews love money. It would work. <laughs> he didn't. There were three means of promoting Hebrew. First of all, journalism. He starts two rival daily newspapers, not one, <laughs> two rival daily newspapers, which he hands out for, for, uh, out for free, because if it's for free, Jews would take it. And these were not the respectable newspapers of the, of the time. Of course, the respectable newspapers of the time were in the languages of culture, Arabic and French. But little by little, Jews started taking those strange leaflets of Ben Yudke Amshuga, as they called him, Ben Yudke the crazy, uh, the lunatic, uh, just to see whether they can understand what he writes about uh, b b b daily affairs with that strange language of his. Um, two, education. Eliezer ben Yehuda says, my generation, well, his generation, is lost. Children should be learning in Hebrew and their parents would follow them. But how? First of all, in the cities, no chance. The teachers did not want to deal with him. And in the settlements, in the Zionist settlements, even if the teachers wanted to teach in Hebrew, there were no games in Hebrew, no books in Hebrew, no songs in Hebrew, nothing. He wrote them all by himself, not with great talent, but at least the teachers had something to start with. And little by little, children started speaking Hebrew or singing Hebrew, and their parents followed. And three, and most important, we're talking about a revolution here, and there's no revolution without violence, good old violence. So a few stories about Ben Yehuda violence. Story number one, 
We all know Rehovot, Rehovot, a nice city in central Israel with a big, important university in the middle, the Weizmann Institute. At the time, a village of Jewish Russian farmers growing vineyards. There's only one, not even a road, a little path in the center of the village of this cluster of homes. It's a would-be avenue. One day it would be an avenue. In the meantime, it's a path with not trees on both sides, but bushes with inspirations, okay? The farmers would come back at dusk from the vineyards and walk to and fro with their wives on this path and uh, discuss whatever happened during the day. The children of Rehovot got a task from their teachers to hide behind the bushes and listen in which language her, their parents are discussing whatever happened. And if they hear that, God forbid, they're doing it in Yiddish or in Russian, they had every permission to jump from behind the bush and prick their parents' tuches with the needle that they got from Eliezer ben Yehuda. And hence, with violence, we conquered Rehovot. Two, a few years ago, I get an email from a lady whom I did not know, and she writes, Dear Mr. Chovav, my father, Mr. Puchachevsky, um, passed away, and I want to publish a book of his writings, and there is a letter that he wrote to my mom about a visit to the Ben Yehuda residence, um, and I want to publish it, but I want you to read it before I do and get your permission. I write back. I'm so sorry about your father. It's so polite of you to ask for my permission, but even according to Israeli law, if one side of the correspondence is okay with its publication, it's kosher. Do whatever you wish. It's yours. She says, young man, you want to read this letter before I publish it. <laughs> Say, okay, okay, send it over. So in this letter about a visit to the Ben Yehuda residence, now, residence, they were so poor that they lived in a studio apartment, a one-room apartment, on the second floor of a house in the old market in the old city of Jerusalem. The only problem was that the apartment was on the second floor, but there was no staircase in the building. So if they wanted to get in or out, it was through a ladder through the window. Residence. Anyway, Mr. Puchachevsky comes to visit Eliezer ben Yehuda, sits to talk to him, and he writes to his wife that when Dvora, Eliezer ben Yehuda's wife, my great-grandmother, came into the room and laid a tray of tea and cookies on the table, he saw that both her arms were black with bruises of pinches. Now, this is not a funny story. It's not a nice story. It's not an amusing story. It's repulsive. He was violent. He wasn't beating his wife, let's not get carried away. But when he pinched, he pinched. But you see, <laughs> he was a prophet. He was a prophet. He was one of our prophets and a revolutionist. And you know, it's never fun to share your life with a prophet or a revolutionist. A revolutionist. I'm sure it wasn't fun to be Che Guevara's girlfriend too. Because these people do not have any sense of humor. They see only one truth. They cannot read reality from two angles. Only one truth. But if that shining light that they see is a true one, we gain a lot. And they have special rights. I, I never knew my grandfather, the first Hebrew child. We'll talk about him in a second. But I knew other children of Eliezer ben Yehuda. They admired him. They never stopped thanking, not God, because in my family the connection is cut between us and there, but they never stopped thanking a destiny for letting them share their lives with such a great man. They would, when they would talk about him, they would never say dad or my father. They would always say my illustrious father. And he, was, he, and he wasn't a good father. They called him a back father because he would be working, standing up. You know, in those days, you wouldn't sit to your desk. You would respect your work. There were tall desks, and you will be working, standing up. A person with tuberculosis, coughing blood, 
working 18 hours a day on the big dictionary, standing up with his back to the room so he won't be distracted. His children were not allowed to speak to him. If they wanted to speak to their dad, to their illustrious father, they would have to hand in a written request to their mother. And then by a week, they would get a five minute interview with their father. And they admired him. They admired each and every one of them admired him. Um, and the man was not only not nice, but also quite weird. Um, I'll tell you a story just to show you how, what a one-trick pony he was. So as I told you, the ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem persecuted the Ben Yehuda family, boycotted the Ben Yehuda family, the worst boycott in Judaism, Pulsa de Nuwa, the boycott of fire, is cast twice upon my family. Uh, it's supposed to work until fourth generation. I'm fourth generation, so if lightning strikes right now and we all die, it's because of me. Uh, so far, it didn't work. Um, uh, they refused to deal with him, to hire him, to trade with him. They would, th would throw stones at him. Uh, they, they told the Ottoman rulers of the country that he was a British spy, and he sat half a year in jail for that, not that he was a spy. They really persecuted him. Now, the house of the Ben Yehuda family, well, once they moved from the old city to the west city, was on the road that led from the ultra-Orthodox uh, neighborhoods to the only hospital that there was in Jerusalem at the time. Uh, one eve of Shabbat, Friday night, the Ben Yehuda family sat and had a Friday night dinner, and suddenly they hear shouting from the street the voice of a young woman shouting in Yiddish, Gewalt, Gewalt, Jews, I'm dying, Mamale, Gewalt, God, help me, I'm dying here and now, Gewalt, help. The kids go out to the balcony, look down, what do they see? In their yard, a young Haredi woman is lying on her back and giving birth. Turned out that it was the eve of Shabbat. The lady was nine months pregnant. She was in labor. Well, they didn't have taxis then, but they, she didn't want to take a horse and carriage to the hospital because maybe Shabbat would enter and it would be a Chilul Shabbat. So she put her trust in God and she started walking to the hospital. Obviously, God was busy doing something else. And with her luck, water broke and here she is giving birth at the yard of Ben Yudke Amshuga. The, the lunatic Ben Yudke, hysterical, shouting in Yiddish, Gewalt, Gewalt, Mamale, I'm dying, do something, help me. The kids get hysterical too. They rush back home, grab their father by his sleeve, do something. Eliezer Ben Yuda walks, down to the, walks out to the balcony, looks down, she's shouting, Gewalt, looks at her and says, shout in Hebrew, and goes back inside. <laughs> this is the person. Um, hmm. A... In 1991, my uh, grandfather, Itamar ben Avi, the first Hebrew child, is born. Uh, is it in 1991? No, I think it's, it's I'm sorry, it's 1882. In 18, they got to Palestine in 1881. 1882, their first child is born. And Eliezer Ben Yehuda decides that this would be the first Hebrew child. After 2,000 years, the first child that, would, that Hebrew would be his mother tongue. He would speak Hebrew from the very first minute. And in order to achieve it, they seal him off the world. They don't let him hear any foreign word. When he's a baby, no, okay. But when he's a toddler, they seal him off from the world in the yard. They, don't, they say, you may play with children who can play in Hebrew with you, but there are no children in the universe who speak Hebrew. He's the only child. And um, when he's four years old, he, he, and his only friend in the world is his dog. Um, and when he's four years old, he runs away with the dog from the yard and walks on the street in Jerusalem, immediately a bunch of ultra-Orthodox kids start chasing them, throwing stones at them. My uh, grandfather is severely wounded. They kill the dog. They kill 
his only friend in the world. And Eliezer ben Yehuda buries the dog in the yard and writes on the tombstone, here lies the first Hebrew dog. <laughs> it's, you know, nowadays we can laugh, but, but, but life was, was really, really difficult. At 1991, 10 years after they immigrate to Palestine, Dvora contracts tuberculosis from him and dies. And immediately after her, three of their children die. And he is left with two orphans, my grandfather and my, my grandfather's sister. And he writes a letter to the Jonas family that already moved from Lithuania to Moscow. They are very well off in Moscow. And he tells them, your elder daughter Dvora just died. I want to marry her younger sister, Bele who is 15 years younger than he is, a, a chemistry student in the University of Moscow. He gets a letter back from the uh, Jonas family. A brilliant idea. <laughs> Come on. Now, for years, I was wondering, what was it in this annoying, short, red-headed, blood-coughing person that made all the Jonas women want to marry him? But I couldn't ask because by last for his father, by last for his father, I would get smacked. Eventually, when I was sort of 30 or 35, I got the nerve to ask Dola. Dola is the daughter of Eliezer ben Yuda and his second wife. His second wife who is the younger sister of his first wife. So I asked uh, Dola, what was it in your father that made them all want to marry him? And Dola, nowadays you will describe it something with four letters like ADHD or something like this. She was ditzy. She was breathless. She couldn't sit down. She was, you know, we call it a neshama vachetzi, a soul and a half trapped in the body of one person. Um, but she told me, Gilly, let me tell you something. All of my life, I was wondering too, but I did not have the nerve to ask anyone until one day I asked my aunt Pnina. Pnina is the third Yonah sister who immigrated from Russia to the States. And what did she say? She said, Dola, my sweet, let me reveal my secret. Let me confess. All of my life, I have been praying to God that your mother would be safe and healthy, but I would add that if anything happens to her, maybe he will marry me too. So there's no other explanation except for the fact that he was deadly sexy, which runs in the family up until today. It wasn't a joke. What are you laughing at? Um, people in Jerusalem tell him, what are you doing? You killed the first one. You'll kill the second. She's younger. She's 15 years younger than you. She could be your daughter. She's a chemistry student in one of the best university in the universities in the world. Well to do. Why does she have to come to, to, to come to Palestine to marry an old widower with two orphans? Leave her alone. And they persuade him. And like he did with her, her elder sister, he does with her. He sends a telegram saying, maybe it's not a good idea. Marry whoever you wish. He gets a telegram from her, on my way to you, wait for a letter. <laughs> and he gets the letter, and in the letter she says, I'm coming to live with you. And if it's for a year, and if it's for a decade, and if it's for all my life, this is my destiny. And they meet in Turkey, and they get married in Turkey, and they sail to Palestine, and he changes her name immediately. He says, your name is not Bele anymore. It's Chemda. It's a beautiful Hebrew name. And of course, she lets him change her name. And they're, they're, yes, I'll be Chemda. And you'll speak only in Hebrew. Yes, of course. And Chemda wrote a few books. Some of them were published, some not. One of the books that were not published is called My War with Satan, in which she describes her efforts for publishing the big dictionary that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but she writes about everything, about life, about what they wore, about what they ate. So she writes about this uh, bridal journey that she does with her husband from Turkey to Jaffa to Jerusalem through that winding road to meet the two orphans of her sister who are waiting for her 
at the gates of Jerusalem to welcome her to her new life. And you know, I went to the National Library and took the manuscript of this book and read it. It was so, I, I was very emotional when I read it. You know, I read it and I said, this is aristocracy. This is our Mayflower. This is how Zionism happened. And then she gets to the point when she meets the children and she writes, and then I saw them at the gates of Jerusalem, two such filthy, ugly apes I have never seen in my life. And I tell myself, Gil Chovav, this is the aristocracy that you are, a filthy, ugly ape, remember. Um, we should talk a bit about Chemda because, you know, often history is unkind to women and attributes achievements of women to the men they lived with. Um, there is no doubt that the revival of Hebrew as a spoken language and that the big dictionary are achievements of Eliezer ben Yuda. You know, whenever I talk to younger crowds about the big dictionary, 17 volumes, I tell them, I don't know if you ever saw it physically. It's huge. It's immense. It's as big as the Encyclopedia Britannica. And then they all look at me and say, as big as what? <laughs> it's as big as Wikipedia, OK? <laughs> it's huge. It's something nations take upon themselves to create, not one sickly person standing up working 18 hours a day and, co and coughing blood. At the time, publishing one volume of the dictionary cost half a million dollars. Now, they were so poor that in her writings, she says that there were days in which the only thing that came into their mouth was the glue of the stamps with which they were sending the newspapers to the settlements. Half a million dollars and for 17 volumes. Where? Where from? She got it all herself. She traveled the world alone, at the turn, a woman alone at the turn of the 20th century, no airplanes by camel, by train, by boat, to Iraq, to the States, to England, to Algeria, to France, to Germany, to Russia, you name it, to beg, borrow, and steal, and get money for the publication of the big dictionary. When Eliezer Ben Yehuda died in 1922, only five volumes of the dictionary were published. So, this wasn't his big victory that he got to see. The victory that he got to see was in what we call the War of Languages. So 1910, word gets out that after 2,000 years, a Jewish university is going to be, to be built in Palestine, in Haifa, a technical university, the Technion. It's there up until today. Money was donated from rich Jews in Germany. It's before the two world wars. They were very comfortable in Germany. And they start building this university. And it's clear that the university would be teaching in the language of science. Now, what is the language of science? Today, it is English with a foreign accent, of course. <laughs> At that time, it was German. And Eliezer Ben Yudan knows that if after 2,000 years, the first Jewish university is going to be teaching in German and not in Hebrew, he lost his cause. Being the annoying person that he was, he organizes a petition. All the teachers in Palestine say, uh, sign it, and it's sent to the Germans, and, it's, and they say, if, you, if this university is going to be teaching in German, we are not going to be teaching in it. The Germans are not impressed. They say, it's OK. We plan to send teachers from Germany anyway. Being the annoying person that he was, another petition. All the students in Palestine signing, if this university teaches in German, send students from Germany as well, because we won't be studying in it. And there are riots. And there's blood on the streets. And the building of the Technion stops for four years. And then it's opened in Hebrew. And a few years later, a year before he dies, he gets to be present at the ceremony of laying the cornerstone 
of a university on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. Now, I'm a graduate of this university. We all know that the university in Jerusalem is called the Hebrew U. No, it's called the Hebrew U because it's pledged to teach in Hebrew. This is how it got its name. And he saw it, and that was his victory. He died in 1922 on the eve of Shabbat in Hanukkah. And when the burial service, ultra-Orthodox people came to take his body on Sunday, they saw that he died with his pen in his hand. And they said, what a heathen, what a heathen, that even when he died, he was doing a Chilul Shabbat. You know, Jews are not supposed to be writing on Saturday. What a heathen. When he died, only five volumes of the dictionary were published. Chemda, his wife, took it upon herself to go on and publish the rest. My grandfather, Itamar ben Avi, the first Hebrew child, helped her, and later on, another son of theirs, Ehud, uh, joined in. And uh, I would like to almost end this talk with a lovely, funny story about how Chemda died. So this is a story that I heard from uh, a relative of mine whom we call Eliezer HaKatan, little Eliezer. He is a grandson of Eliezer ben Yudah. I'm a great grandson, so he's one generation above me. He is the son of Ehud. Ehud is a son of Eliezer ben Yudah. Ehud had a boy and a girl. He named the boy Eliezer after his father, and he named the girl Eliezer after his father. <laughs> Eliezer, Eliezer Akatan, little Eliezer is 80 something, a tall, big guy, the sweetest guy, speaks perfect Hebrew, was born in Jerusalem. Today, he's a rabbi in Florida. Eliezer Ben Yehuda rolls in his grave like this, a rabbi in our family, God forbid. The sweetest guy. I love him, I love him, I love him. And he told me the story about how Chemda, his grandmother, died. So they were at home. She was already bedridden. She was very old and very ill. And she calls him to her room and she says, Eliezer, I'm going to give you a note. Take it. On it, there's a phone number. Dial it and say that Chemda ben Yehuda says that David and Moshe must come right away. He dials. David and Moshe knock on the door. He ushers them in. What do we learn from this story? that in Israel of the early 50s, when an eight-year-old kid dials the office of the prime minister and says, my grandmother, Chemda ben Yudah, says that David and Moshe must come right away. David ben Gurion, the prime minister, and Moshe Sharet, the secretary of state, come right away. Because they were terrified of her. She was a horrible, horrible, horrible woman. All of Jerusalem was afraid of her. And he takes them to her bedroom, and they stand like this, shivering next to her bed, and she's covered to her chin like this. She looks up at them, and she says, Guys, I am going to die, but I won't die until you promise me that the big dictionary is going to be published to the end. Now, they were so frightened that immediately they went like this. No, 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 no. Don't nod at me. You will say it with your own mouth. And if you don't say it, I won't die. <laughs> so they said yes, and she died. <laughs> but because of her, because of her, and because of him, I have a homeland, and I have a culture, and I have a language, and I have an identity. I know who I am. And I have my pride, and I have a daughter that every morning when she opens her beautiful eyes, she doesn't say jetem, and she doesn't say I love you, and she doesn't say ana bahibak. She says, ani ohevet otcha. So I guess it was worth it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And because, because well, you were perfect USC students and guests and you behaved very well, I just owe you the end of the first story. So here I am at the newspaper getting word that it happened yet again, not knowing what to do. At the end I, sa at the end I said, you know, news are not mine. My aunt would hear about it the next day anyway. I phoned her. I said, Aunt Trina, I'm so sorry. I have some unpleasant news. It happened yet again. The graves are desecrated. Nasty graffitis in black tar. 
My aunt said, Gilly, did you only get word of it or did you get photographs as well? And I said, come on, leave it. I'll send my elderly aunt photographs of the desecrated graves of the family. I said, no, 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 no. You don't have to send me anything. I want you to look at the pictures. I said, yes. She said, the nasty graffitis. In which language? I said in Hebrew, and she said, yes! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions about Hebrew, about my family, about desecrating graves, about whatever, I'm here to answer any question. Yes, please. Um, no, and you know, it was even, I'm, I'm just, I just finished writing a book about the love letters between my grandfather and my grandmother, so it's one generation down. In the Ben Yehuda family, they even didn't say tipesh. They would say patish instead, it's, it's the, because it's, it's dirty, so, so no. The, the curses are, in Hebrew, we curse in Arabic. <laughs> Or in biblical Hebrew. The cruelty of the Orthodox that you described is enough to scare the crap out of the average person. What in the world is going on over there? Why was he persecuted by the ultra Orthodox? For two reasons. One, they believed that uh, Hebrew is a holy language and, you're, and it should be used only for prayer. You're not supposed to be going to the bedroom in Hebrew or to the toilet, God forbid. Secondly, it was a political thing. Uh, he came to Palestine and he saw that they were not working. They were living off donations from the diaspora. Some things never change, do they? Um, uh, they were they're not working. And being the annoying person that he was, he wrote articles in all the newspapers, of, the Jewish newspapers of the diaspora, stop sending them money. We want to build a healthy nation here. Tell them to go to work. And for them, it was Satan. So, yes, please. Um, you know, it, it's a wonderful question because, as I hinted before, um, he was really despised uh, and, 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 and hated by the big, big, big culture figures of, 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 of our culture, Bialik, Agnon, Brenner, they all hated him because he was very free and creative and he saw Hebrew as something that belongs to him and he took every liberty in reviving Hebrew. Now, Bialik, Re actually revived more, more words than Eliezer ben Yehuda. If it, but this is not a competition, first of all, but, but this is not the main thing. If, if you count the words that Bialik cre created and the word that uh, ben Yehuda created, think that Bialik created something like 360 and ben Yehuda 320. But Bialik believed that... So what was the situation? There were immigrants coming, you know, Zionist people coming from... Iraq and from the States and from Eastern Europe and from Germany and from France and from, they did not have a common language. The Tower of Babel collapsed because the Masons did not have a common language. How do they say that weird scissors that we pluck off grapes from the vine with? So they would send letters to Bialik and to Ben Yehuda and to Agnon. Bialik said, good question we will form a committee in Odessa. And they would read the Talmud, and they would look for something. In the meantime, Eliezer ben Yudha said, say Mazmera, it will work. <laughs> so he was very rapid. He was borrowing words, stealing words from, first of all, from Semitic languages, but also from German, from French, from any, any language, just so you have something to work with. And I think that this was a very Zionist thing to do. They were more, more cultured, of course. He was a doer. He was, you know, uh, and uh, so in that sense, you can see that the early Hebrew, the Hebrew of the late 19th century, is very flexible, like he was.
Totally. 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 Thank you so much. Sure. Yes, please. He was a polyglot. Most people in, in that era were polyglots, especially in Jerusalem. You know, you had to speak at least five languages to survive. He was a polyglot not only in live languages, but in dead languages as well. The big Ben Yehuda dictionary, it's a scientific work of trying to resurrect Hebrew through writings in eight different Semitic languages. Now, there are no eight live Semitic languages. So we have Arabic, which is the most beautiful language in the world, and the language of culture. And it's immense and it's wonderful, and of course, he did wonders with Arabic, but there is uh, Aramaic, and I, I don't know how do you say Akkadit, Akkadaic, Akkadian, and Gerez, and Urdu, and all other languages that he taught himself. And then he would travel the world to big libraries, read writings in those languages, and beg, borrow, and steal words to Hebrew. So, so, and on top of this, of course, he spoke. Yiddish and German and uh, English and French and uh, Italian and Spanish it, languages came very naturally to him. Okay, yes? So the dictionary is, what is it translated? Well, it was Hebrew to? Hebrew to Hebrew. Hebrew. But, but a, it's a Hebrew Hebrew language. It's like uh, your big uh, Oxford dictionary or whatever. But um, every word would have its origins in other Semitic languages. So he would say, you say, for instance, uh, kuvit, okay, a cauliflower is kuvit in Hebrew, because in Arabic it's kurnub, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He would show how other Semitic languages have simil uh, sim uh, similar structures. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> So the question is, how do I feel when I walk the streets of Jerusalem? I'll tell you. I was born in Jerusalem. I no longer live in Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is a wonderful city. All of my generation left Jerusalem. All of my generation left Jerusalem, either to the suburbs or to Tel Aviv or to other parts of Israel. Jerusalem became a very religious a conservative city, which is okay, which is okay. I think that religious conservative people should have somewhere to live, and if they choose to live in Jerusalem, I'm all for it. I don't feel I belong. And this is where my childhood was. I wrote a trilogy about my childhood in Jerusalem, all the stories, I, I love it, you know, it's filled with memory and history, and, but, uh, it's not, it's, I think it's no longer a pleasant city to live in. It's, it's a wonderful city to visit. I left Jerusalem behind. Yes, please. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask kind of on the question with how the language has evolved over the years. Obviously, I don't think we're ready to have it just stick in the same, you know, word frame that we created. But also, We're talking about the evolution of Hebrew. Um, so many people ask me if he would resurrect today. What would he say about Hebrew that is filled with tech words and we filled with English words and filled with Arabic? I think he would have been elated because you should understand, we always think when we say the revival of Hebrew, we think of the big dictionary and inventing words. No, this was not what he meant to do. He was a Zionist. He saw Hebrew as a necessary means for the revival of the Jewish state. And first of all, we have achieved this victory. I was born in my own state, you know, I have my own education system, judicial system, etc. And secondly, he wanted Hebrew to live. 
He wanted people to speak Hebrew. He wanted it to be a real language. And a real language should be a tolerant landlord. A real language embraces other languages, neighboring na languages. Your English is filled with foreign words, filled with foreign words. Biblical Hebrew is filled with foreign words. The Mishnah and the Talmud, most of it is in Aramaic, and what is not is filled with Greek. So, and Arabic, not, nowadays, Arabic is very present in Hebrew, of course. So, um, I think that uh, he would love it. He would love the vibrance of the language and the fact that, uh, that it can, that, that it's sure of itself, and it can let, we no longer have to be Puritans and say, no, 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 you don't, no, no. there's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful letter, uh, not one, but, uh, you know, at the time, Hebrew was very political. So there are letters of uh, people of Tel Aviv in the 30s. Tel Aviv is the first Hebrew city. So people of Tel Aviv writing city hall about plumbing and sewage and the street lighting, etc. And they did it in Yiddish because they just came from Europe like uh, five years ago. City Hall replies, this is a Hebrew city. If you want to get service, write in Hebrew. If you write in another language, you won't get service. So at the time, we had to be strict. Nowadays, you may write in Arabic, of course. You may write in Ethiopian to your city hall. You may write in any language. You may speak in any language. Hebrew is in the air. It will, it will win. Yes, please. Uh, so, what's the difference between Ben Yehuda's vision and the Hebrew Academia? Ben Yehuda is the founder of the Hebrew Academia. At the time, it was called Vada Lashon, the language committee. He slammed the door and left after a month and a half. Um, just to show you how, how hated he was, Brenner, one of our greatest writers, called a the Vaad Alashon, Vaad Alashon, so the, the language committee, he called it Havaad Levurut Uletimtum, the committee for uh, uh, ignorance and stupidity. Uh, nowadays, the Hebrew Academia is a very, very, very important institution financed by the state with very scholarly people in it um, that I really respect. I do not uh, agree with their way of conducting Hebrew. It, they, are, they are a bunch of religious people, not ultra-Orthodox, but religious, and they think they tend towards the Bialik attitude. Everything should have an origin not in any Semitic language, in the Mishnah, the Talmud, and the Bible. So they try to keep Hebrew more, uh, I would say, biblical. And, uh, but they do great work. And uh, I really admire them. I, sometimes we disagree. <laughs> yes, please. He didn't use the word Yeah. Was he actually excommunicated? Yes, yes, twice. The, the boycott of fire, twice. Now, the boycott of fire is really a seri serious stuff. If you are, if this spell is cast upon you by those rabbis, you're supposed to die within two years. And your siblings are supposed to die. <laughs> and it was done twice. And now and when we say boycott, it's not just this voodoo, OK? But it's really, they refused to bury his dead. They refused to trade with him. He couldn't go and buy milk in the store. They refused to hire him. He couldn't work as a teacher because they said, if he teaches in a school, we'll take our children out. So, so yes, he was really boycotted in the most severe and mean way that possible. Yes, please. How do you think the situation would be different if your great grandfather had died in Paris and had I, You know, it, it, it's difficult to be a prophet to the past, but I'm, I'll tell you a story that, that shows what I think, because I don't want to be too sharp about it. But a few years ago, I was 
invited by the authorities of uh, Belarus. Now, now Luzhki, that village that he was born in, is no longer in Lithuania, it's in Belarus. Yeah, borders have changed, etc. And they want to reclaim great people that were born in Belarus. Mark Chagall, for instance, and Eliezer Ben Yehuda. And I was invited to the laying of a, a very big, you know, first of all, his statue in the central uh, culture uh, avenue of, the, of the, their capital. And secondly, um, a very big sign and a stone at the entrance to what is considered the house he was born in, in Luzhki. And it was a very emotional ceremony and very nice, and they were very sweet, etc. And after the ceremony, as a part of the program, they took us to a nearby forest and they showed us the mass grave of the 452 Jews that were left in the ghetto of Luzhki and were assassinated in the Holocaust. Had we not had Hebrew, we, have, we would all have been dead by now. It's clear to me. Israel was the solution. It was clear to him. You know, whenever I lecture around the world, people from communities that are trying to reclaim their language for political reasons ask me, ask me why did it happen, happen only once? When I'm in Catalonia, the, the, the best example of, of a group of people trying to reclaim their language, they say, we are Catalan. We are reclaiming Catalonia. I tell them, there is reclaiming and there is reclaiming. You, the, the street signs are in Catalan. There are universities who teach in Catalan. You may open a bank account in Catalan, but when a child is born in Barcelona, he speaks Spanish. Later on, he will learn Catalan. And they say, yes, but why can't we do that extra mile? Why, we don't succeed. Why? And I tell them, luckily, you're too well off. What would happen if you won't have your liberty? It would be said, I'm all for your liberty, Palestinian liberty, you name it, any liberty. But you won't get killed. You won't get assassinated. This is why Zionism happened, because there was a generation that understood that it's either death or immigration and a new start. And he was one of the leaders of that. Okay, but what language, let's say the Zionism would have continued, do you think without him, I don't think it would have continued without Hebrew. Herzl disagreed with me. Well, Gilchobav or Herzl? Gilchobav or Herzl? Whom should we pick? Herzl believed that there would be a Jewish state and everybody will be speaking German because he came from power. He was assimilated already. And he wanted to copy Austria to the Carmel Mountain. So his, his vision of a state is very, very, very European. Israel is not European. Israel is something totally different. It's a mix. It couldn't have happened in German. It just couldn't have happened in German. And didn't, of course. Yes, please. In the early days of fighting for Israel, was the armies that they had, like the warriors back then, whatever, were they speaking just in Hebrew? Even though they just had the Hebrew? I... So it depends on when we're talking about. If we're talking about really the War of Independence, 1948, this is very late compared to Elizabeth Judah. If we're talking about earlier, a, I would assume that it, it, it was a mix. I mean, they knew that they should be speaking in Hebrew. Some of them just didn't know it. Uh, but uh, it was the Zionist thing to do. So you, you wanted to shop. Hebrew, to speak Hebrew, to bury in Hebrew, to love in Hebrew. Some of them didn't know it, but uh, they were all trying to, very hard, especially if they were Zionists. One last question. Let me shh, shh. Oh, I have two questions. Go for it. So Yeah, uh, not the last resource, but, it, well, you know, it, I guess that he would, it, you could say that a biblical word was, was better. 
but not always did he try to look at the Bible. For instance, the word that we use today for an airplane belongs to Bialik. It's matos. Eliezer ben Yehuda's word is aviron. Why? Because, first of all, it's something that flies in the air, in the avir, but also because it sounds like avion in French. So he didn't go to the Bible for this. He said, let us make it a bouba, a doll, is poupée in French. So he would borrow sounds from other languages, not from the Bible. But I would assume that if he had something from the Bible, he preferred it. He had a few allies, mostly Sephardic and not Ashkenazi. Uh, again, it's not that he was persecuted by the religious community in Jerusalem, only by the ultra-Orthodox. It's, it's two different communities. Uh, the, the allies were in the settlements, definitely. The first, uh, the first Hebrew school was in Rishon LeZion. The second, even though they claim that they are the first, was in Roshpina. So it's settlements. It's tiny, tiny, tiny villages. There is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story that during one of the boycotts, the Ben Yudah family was really under siege on Passover in Jerusalem. They couldn't even go out to buy food uh, for the Seder. And then a convoy of brave men on horses came from the Moshavot, from the settlements, and said, you are our prophet. We came to celebrate with you. And they all had a Seder in Jerusalem. So um, the, the big the, the spreading Hebrew was done through schools, and the schools were in the Moshavot. And little by little did it in, and the newspapers, of course. But, uh, but, but the actual teaching of Hebrew was done first in the Moshavot and then in cities. Thank you very, very, very much, guys. It was a severe pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.